I've been talking about how cults operate for a long time, so I figured we'd take a look at Google's most searched questions about cults and see if we can find the answer. Let's get into it. The first question we've got is how cults work. This one is a little abstract, so let's take a look at the next few questions and see if they answer it for us. The next one is how cults brainwash. There are a few top people in the field of cult research. Back in the 60s, a guy named Robert J. Lifton wrote a book called Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism. American soldiers are being captured by the Chinese, and a few months later, a video would surface of the U.S. soldier saying all this great stuff about the Chinese government and communism, and a bunch of negative propaganda about the U.S. government. My name is Harold Webb from West Palm Beach, Florida. My name is Aaron Wilson from Urania, Louisiana. This is a very happy moment for me, for now I am free. Free from McCarthyism. Friends, the only way to stop fascism in America is to do as I have done. Stand up and fight for our rights. My name is Louis Griggs and my home is at Jacksonville, Texas. I stayed behind to escape the Red Bait and McCarthy and are sure and I'll never again have to fight in another unjust war as I did in Korea. Even if I had won in repatriation, the fate of Dickinson and Bachelor would have stopped me. My name is Richard Tennyson. I live in Alden, Minnesota. People who hate war and stand up for their beliefs are faced with McCarthy and his fascist stop control House and Americans Activities Committee. I will return someday when I can speak for peace lawfully. How'd they get to that point? These people were born and raised in the U.S. They had family in the U.S. The answer is, they were brainwashed. So Robert Lifton set his mind to understanding how it happened. You should give the book a read if you're really interested, but here's the short answer. They used a combination of negative and positive reinforcement to change the soldiers' personality until it matched what they wanted it to be. The Chinese would treat the prisoners of war really well. That challenged their perception of the situation. They were trained to view the Chinese as the enemy. Now that they changed their perception, they needed to change their behavior. What you do on the outside is reflected on the inside, and vice versa. So they'd offer little things to the soldiers if they were willing to say something good about the Chinese Communist Party. They wouldn't offer them so much that they could justify doing it to their friends. Like if they'd offered the soldiers freedom just to say something nice about the CCP, then it might be a justifiable trade-off. It would be little things, like cigarettes. They'd say, if you write an essay where you say one good thing about the US and one good thing about the CCP, then we'll give you five cigarettes. Cigarettes. That would make this stay a little more pleasant for them. And it's just one thing, so why not? They'd do it. Then they'd have them write one bad thing about the US and one bad thing about the CCP. They'd take those essays and hang them up all over the camp. When asked about it, what's the person gonna say? They turned into a traitor for a few cigarettes? They'd go in defense mode and make up some story about why they wrote it, and it would open their friends up to the idea that it wasn't so bad. They wanted them to own what they'd done. Slowly but surely, they'd modify people's behavior with rewards and punishments effectively programming in a new personality. They get you to go this far, what about a little further? Can they get you to talk to a CO about the good qualities about China if they give you an extra pillow to sleep with? What's the big deal? Over the course of months, slowly but surely, they managed to re-educate POWs and turn them into advocates for communism. Fundamentally, that's how cults work too. They isolate you from friends and family, make you reliant and obedient to them, and then modify your behavior until your personality is a reflection of what they want it to be. So in a nutshell, that's how cults brainwash people. And I think that covers the next question too. How do cults rewire the brain? Let's take a look at the next one. How do cults recruit? This one includes some level of manipulation too. Usually cults look for people who might be in an emotionally vulnerable situation. Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, will go on Twitter and search for any references to death in the family. And then when they find somebody at their weakest point, they strike. Drop links to articles on their website, or they'll tell them there's still a chance to see the person again. Other groups go about it in a different way. The Mooney's cult goes to college campuses and appeals to people's interest in higher education. They tell them they have a workshop or a seminar they want them to attend. And it's completely free. It'll teach you about high-level ideas. They try to appeal to curiosity. Interestingly enough, that's how some far-right organizations do their recruiting too. They appeal to people's egos and make them feel like they're above everybody else if they just join this group. Anyways, here's the next one. How are cults formed? This one is complicated. I came up with some of this myself after years of 
studying and learning about this. But in my experience, cults usually come in three flavors. They're what I call decentralized and non-focused, decentralized but focused, and centralized and hierarchical. Level one, level two, and level three, in that order. Cults can't be categories like Christianity or Islam. They have to be specific, distinct groups like Scientology, Heaven's Gate, or Jonestown. Decentralized, non-focused cults are groups that don't really have much of a leadership or didn't start out with one. They just kind of sprang up out of nothing. Usually they start on social media. A good example would be flat earthers, anti-vax mom groups, or certain vegan groups. Then we have decentralized but focused groups. This would be your cult of personality. Groups in this category usually have little to no direct contact with their leader, but the leader is one specific person who spreads an ideology to others. Outside of that structure, it still has to operate like a cult to be considered one. Joe Biden has an ideology he disseminates to others, but the members aren't experiencing personality modification, the hallmark of every cult. In a cult of personality, the person's followers will take their word over hard evidence. Like, for example, Trump supporters who refuse to accept that Biden won, even to this day. Richard Spencer, Teal Swan, and even QAnon would be considered level two cults, decentralized but focused. But Q, the leader of QAnon, seems to have gone away. They haven't made new posts since the election. So QAnon has kind of morphed from a level two, decentralized but focused, to a level one, decentralized and non-focused. Then we have level three cults, centralized and hierarchical. This category includes all your traditional cults, Jehovah's Witnesses, Heaven's Gate, the People's Temple, aka Jonestown, Scientology, and others. Usually there's a strict hierarchy with distinct leadership and generals who speak for the leader and take direct control over their subordinates. Jehovah's Witnesses have a governing body who claim to get guidance from God about what their ideology should be, and then they pass that information down to the generals. They call them district and circuit overseers, and they pass it down to the members too through their Watchtower and Awake magazines and other reading materials. If somebody steps out of line, they're punished for it. That's the kind of thing you can expect from cults. Now, at the start of this section, I said some of this stuff is original to me. The information about different cults, decentralized and focused, and decentralized and non-focused, were my ideas. The study of centralized and hierarchical cults has been around for a very long time and is well studied by experts. So back to the question, how are cults formed? It depends on the cult and the type of cult. Decentralized, non-focused cults usually form through social media. When there's no clear leadership, a hierarchy usually forms organically. In the Flat Earth Movement, some voices have floated to the top and they're responsible for presenting the supposed best arguments for the group. The more extreme you are, the more upvotes you get. It's a vicious cycle of desperately trying to get approval from the people around you. And before you know it, you have a small chain of people who are the most respected out of everybody else because they devote the most time and energy to the cause. Everybody looks to them and tries to emulate them. That's how decentralized, non-focused cults form. Cults of personality seem pretty straightforward. Usually it comes from somebody who's particularly charismatic and thinks they're a little smarter than they are. They form out a lens they use to view the world, and they pass that lens down to others, like Jordan Peterson, for example, or Donald Trump, or Teal Swan. As for centralized hierarchical cults, the common perception is that these start as religions, but that doesn't always have to be the case. Scientology did not start as a religion. It's a psychology cult, not a religious cult. Same with Heaven's Gate. It wasn't really a religious cult. It was a UFO cult. These groups commonly integrate religion into the belief system, usually to avoid taxes, as in Scientology's case, but not always. They usually start as small groups of friends who have common beliefs, and they start getting more and more extreme until they go completely off the deep end. Anyways, let's look at the next question on the list. The next question is, how do cults become religions? That's an interesting question. The implication is that every religion started out as a cult, a premise I completely disagree with. Not all cults are religions, and not all religions are cults. But I'm guessing this came from that bit from the Joe Rogan comedy routine where he says, in a cult, they follow everything this guy says, and in a religion, that guy is dead. It's a good joke, but it doesn't match the science. Religions and cults aren't the same. Next question. How do cults make money? This obviously varies from group to group, but as I mentioned earlier, lots of cults try to achieve tax-exempt status any way they can. And in some cases, the quickest and easiest way to do that is to turn yourself into a religion. Ad revenue is a pretty popular way to make money, so some decentralized, non-focused cults will start YouTube channels or Facebook pages. Cults of personality will profit off of merchandising and donations from the adherents. But centralized and hierarchical cults, that one is the most interesting. Again, they'll usually profit from merchandising, ad revenue, all the same stuff as the others, but they'll usually have another operation on the side. Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, have to learn how to survive with basically zero donations from the members because they discourage their members from going to college
college or otherwise investing in their future because I think the end is so close. As an ex-Jehovah's Witness, I was told it was going to happen any five minutes now since I was born. So how do they do it? They encourage their members to learn trades since the beginning because when Armageddon happens, all the loyal Jehovah's Witnesses will be left on Earth to rebuild afterward and will never die after Armageddon strikes. So we won't need doctors or lawyers or politicians or any of that. What we'll need is people who know carpentry and plumbing. And conveniently, Jehovah's Witnesses use those skills now to generate money for the organization. They'll do what they call a quick build, where they have a congregation of 100 Jehovah's Witnesses come in and build a brand new kingdom hall from the ground up in a weekend. If they need to, they'll pay for the building materials and the land, but more often than not, even those things are donated. Then they'll move all the Jehovah's Witnesses into the new kingdom hall they just built, and they'll sell off the old kingdom hall and properties. They were real tight on money a few years back because of all the lawsuits they were facing, so they sold off their entire headquarters in New York City. Some estimates say they got around $1.3 billion for it. Holy shit! Anyways, they had these people come in and build a brand new headquarters in a cheaper area, donating their free labor, and came out the other side with way more money than they started with. Other groups do it slightly differently. Scientology makes the recruits feel like they have special information that not just anybody is allowed access to. And if you want access to the special information too, you have to pay for it. It can cost up to $200,000 per person to move up the ranks to become a mid-level Scientologist, called Going Clear. If you want to reach the very top levels, it'll probably take about $500,000 to a million dollars, and two to five years of work, at least. It's the perfect racket. Anyways, that's all I've got for you. Don't forget, if you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, you can check me out on Patreon. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring or my Etsy shop. All links are in the description as always. Okay, thanks for watching guys.